Hey gamers, Chris here. Now, are you new to playing D&D, or maybe you have played D&D once or twice, and for the first time you want to tackle something like spellcasting, or maybe you're a player or a DM who's played for a while, and you're introducing somebody who's new to D&D and needs a little help in building a new character, particularly at the low levels, just getting started, then this is the video for you. We are going to be doing a beginner's guide. Today we're going to start with the Rogue Arcane Trickster. Uh, and what we're going to be doing with these guides is we're just going to do a four level build. So we're just really talking about getting things started. And we're going to talk about the rules, how they work, uh, the kind of decisions we make when making characters to make them effective uh, beyond just the couple footnotes that you find in the player's handbook, which are actually pretty good for beginners. But we're going to go a little deeper today, beyond just building the beginning character, we're going to talk about choosing races, how to level up, how spells work, that kind of thing. And we're going to start with our Rogue Arcane Trickster today. I think this is a great way for a new player to be introduced to D&D, because the Rogue, of course, is iconic. It's not that hard to play, and by doing Arcane Trickster, it moves you into spellcasting in a relatively safe route, because an Arcane Trickster doesn't have to use spells at all. So those spells become kind of an extra thing, a great way to just kind of ease yourself into the mechanics of spell casting and figuring it out. So the next time, if they want to try something a little more complicated, like a wizard or a druid, they're going to have that basis of knowledge. So if you're new to the channel, thank you for joining me. And if you're not new, well, still, welcome to Tree and Monk's Temple. Okay, so let's start by talking about the Rogue itself. The Rogue, of course, is an iconic character class in D&D. Uh, started out as a thief in the very first editions of D&D, and then we eventually started calling it a Rogue, because not all Rogues have to be thieves, but there's certain things, things that we kind of associate with the class. Uh, the first is picking locks, uh, finding and removing traps, and sneaking. Now, in 5th edition, you don't have to be a Rogue to do any of those things. You can do all of those things with any class in the game. Uh, but rogues are still well known for that, and they're good at it. Now there's a couple of things that a rogue is well known for that other classes don't do, and those are things like sneak attack and cunning action. These are things that are unique to the rogue. They're not that hard to use, but they're effective, and that's a good way for a new player to get introduced to Dungeon Dragons. So as a rogue, what are you expected to do? Well, you are expected in combat to be able to deliver damage. Uh, rogues are reasonably good at delivering damage. They can do so in melee, which means with a short-range weapon, or at long-range with things like bows. Now, don't be surprised as a rogue if you find that there are certain classes or certain builds that end up doing significantly more damage than you. There are specialized damage builds out there that can do a lot of damage, and a rogue doesn't do that kind of damage. But as a rogue, you should expect to do reasonable amounts of damage in combat, certainly enough to be a relevant force with your group. The other things rogues are good at are skills. Rogues get more skill proficiencies than any other class in the game, and they get what's called expertise, and expertise is a way to become even better in those skills. Now those things aren't entirely unique, but the rogue is at the top tier for skills. Thematically, rogues tend to be sneaky, they tend to be quick, they tend to use light weapons and strike hard. Now mechanically, be aware that rogues are not as good defensively. Rogues don't wear a lot of heavy armor, and if they get hit, you can expect you can't take a lot of damage before you go down. So it is important when you play a rogue to play with a certain level of caution. So the class features you are going to be having with a rogue include a d8 hit point per level. d8 is okay. It is somewhere in the middle. We tend to go from d6 to d12. So d8 means you will have more hit points than the weakest members of the party, but significantly less than the toughest members of the party. Our armor proficiencies include light armor only. That's things like leather or studded leather. That's not a whole lot of protection. So don't expect to have a great defense with your rogue. It's important with a rogue to position yourself in a place where you're not going to take a lot of attacks. Because if you take a lot of attacks, you're going to go down. 
in terms of weapon proficiencies, rogues have a pretty good selection. Uh, they can't use every weapon in the game, but they can use pretty much every weapon that you're going to want to use. Things like short swords, daggers, rapiers, bows, the kind of things you would expect somebody who's very light on their feet to be good at, they can do those kinds of things. Uh, the one omission is longbows. You kind of figure that a rogue might use a longbow. They can't. They can use short bows, they can use crossbows. Both short bows and crossbows are fine. But if you do want to use a longbow, there are races you can choose that are going to give you access to that. The tool proficiency you start with is Thieves' Tools. Uh, thieves' Tools are what are used to open locks. They are also used to disable certain kinds of traps. Uh, so that's usually what Thieves' Tools are used for. Uh, again, other kinds of classes can get access to Thieves' Tool proficiencies and Thieves' Tools. So this isn't unique to rogues, but rogues are all decent at it. The saving throws they're proficient in are dexterity and intelligence. These are the kinds of things that you would think a character that's light on his feet and quick with his mind would be good at resisting. This includes a lot of the damaging spells, things like fireball. Uh, so that's a good thing to be proficient in when you don't have a lot of hit points. Then you're going to choose four skills and you get a great skill selection here. Uh, and four skill proficiencies is a great starting skill proficiency. It's the best in the game. So let's talk a little bit about the special abilities of the rogue. The first one to talk about is expertise. Right at first level, we're going to pick two skills that we're an expert at. That means when we add our skill proficiency, we're going to add double our skill proficiency. At first level, that's going to be a plus two to our roll on a d20. Uh, but as we level up, that's going to increase more and more. At sixth level, we're going to be able to choose two additional skills to be expert in. Again, expertise is not unique to the rogue, but it is a very good ability, and most of your party will not have access to it. Now let's talk about what is probably the premier ability of the rogue, and that's sneak attack. And this starts right at first level. We can deal an additional 1d6 damage with an attack. There are certain conditions for that, though. Either an ally needs to be within 5 feet of the enemy you're attacking, uh, now that doesn't have to mean that you're within five feet of that enemy. You can be firing at long range with a bow or a crossbow. As long as you have an ally within five feet of that enemy, then you get your sneak attack. The second thing that can qualify you for sneak attack is if you are attacking with advantage. If you're attacking with advantage, you always qualify for sneak attack. So if you qualify for sneak attack, you make your attack roll as normal, you make your damage roll as normal, then you roll your sneak attack dice and add it to your damage roll. As a rogue, you want to be delivering sneak attack on most, if not all, your attacks. And that's not hard to do. You just need to be able to pick the enemies that are going to qualify. Now, the only weapons that qualify for sneak attack are ranged or finesse weapons. That happens to be most weapons that you're ever going to want to use anyways. So that's not a problem at all. Final ability we're going to get at first level is Thieves Cant. And Thieves Cant is basically like an additional language. You can use little hand signals or innuendo to send secret messages to other people who know Thieves Cant. Now only rogues know Thieves Cant. So if you are using this ability, it only really comes into play if there's other rogues involved. But if there is, it's an interesting way to kind of do secret messages with each other. Now we're going to make a character together. Now I use D&D Beyond for the purpose of making characters. If you are new to the game, you can use D&D Beyond for free, but you can only access the basic rules. If you want to access any of the rules beyond the basic rules, that's going to require you to pay for those rules on D&D Beyond. Now, as for what sources I'm going to use, I'm going to restrict myself to what would be available if we were going to play a D&D adventure using only the player's handbook. Uh, so there are lots of nice abilities available in things like the Sword Coast Adventures Guide for rogues that are very good. But when you're a beginner, you maybe don't have access to all those books. So let's just talk about the player's handbook. This is the basic rule book. Now that will limit our options and it will make it so we can't make this character quite as powerful as it would be if we could access some of those other sources, but we can still make it an effective character using only the player's handbook. So we're going to do this character one level at a time and we're going to begin with first level. So we're going to select one level of rogue. Now, after we select our level of rogue, there are some options we need to choose. We're going to choose four skill proficiencies, and we're going to choose two expertises. Now, the first proficiency I'll always choose, if it is available, is perception. Perception is an ability you're going to use more than any other skill in the game. Now, because we are a rogue, 
There are certain other skills I think are really appropriate thematically for rogues, and you're going to find them useful. The first of those is stealth. So stealth is your ability to hide and move silently. The second is sleight of hand. Sleight of hand is your ability to pick pockets or just simply to palm something or do something with your hands in a way that other people might not notice. The final one I'm going to take is acrobatics. Acrobatics includes things like tumbling, balancing, a lot of these things that you might have to do as a rogue type character. At first level we're going to choose expertise in two of those skill proficiencies and the two I think are obvious choices are perception and stealth. These are likely the skill proficiencies you're going to use more than any of the others. That's why getting an additional bonus to these is I think the most valuable for this selection. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to select a background uh, and I think it's important to talk about backgrounds a little bit because there's a lot of confusion about backgrounds. If you go looking at guides online, they're going to talk about selection of backgrounds as if there's good choices and bad choices. I don't think that's the case. If we look at what the player's handbook has to say about backgrounds, this is what it's going to say. It's going to say that you're going to select a background, it's going to involve two skills, and it's going to involve two of either languages or tool proficiencies. But here's what's important. If a character would gain the same proficiency from two different sources, he or she can choose a different proficiency of the same kind, skill or tool, instead. That means you don't have to worry about any kind of redundancy. Pick the background you want. And then if it has the same skill proficiencies or two proficiencies you already have, you simply select something else. Furthermore, we can go beyond that. Right within the rules it says under customizing a background, you might want to tweak some of the features of a background so it better fits your character or the campaign setting. To customize a background, you can replace one feature with another one, choose any two skills, then choose a total of two tool proficiencies or languages from the sample backgrounds. You can use either the equipment package from your background or spend coin on gear as described in Chapter 5. So this is super flexible. Make a background whatever you want. If you see your character as a criminal background but you don't like the criminal background proficiencies or maybe their tool proficiencies, you can simply change them. It's okay. Always check with your DM just to be sure, but it is within the rules that you are allowed to do so. In our case, I think the most traditional background for a rogue would be a criminal. So let's make our character a criminal. As a criminal, we would normally have access to the deception skill and the stealth skill. Except we already have the stealth skill, so we're going to select a different skill instead. Because our character is going to be an arcane trickster, I like the idea of her having a little bit of knowledge in the field of arcana. So let's select that right now. We then get two tool proficiencies for our character. The first proficiency is with a gaming set of our choice. Now our character is a rogue with sleight of hand, so I love the idea of a playing card set. Now, a criminal would normally get thieves tools proficiency, but we already have that. So we're going to choose a different tool proficiency. And the one I think fits is disguise kit. As a rogue, we might be expecting to disguise ourselves as something else or simply disguise ourselves to evade the law. Because remember, we are a criminal as well. So proficiency in a disguise kit would allow us to do that. Now, we don't get the disguise kit to begin with. That's something we'll have to purchase, which we can do through gameplay. So now we're going to choose our ability scores. Now some DMs have you roll ability scores and you'll roll 4d6 and then you put them where you want them to go. Uh, and you're going to put them top to bottom in a very similar order to what I'm going to show you here. There's two other methods of generating ability scores. Those are point by and the standard array. The standard array I think is the best one for beginners uh, because it's the easiest to use. Uh, so hopefully your DM is going to have you use the standard array but if not uh, if you're using a point by, you can simulate the standard array. And if you are using the die rolls, then I would simply put top to bottom prioritization the same as I'm doing with the standard array. So what the standard array does is we have six ability scores. Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma. So these are the characteristics of our character. Are we strong? Are we smart? And these are based on a scale that traditionally goes from 3 to 18. Uh, now it probably goes more from 8 to 20. Uh, 8 being poor, 20 being amazing. Now we're not going to start with a 20. The highest any first level character could ever start with, unless they're rolling ability scores, is a 17. 
in most cases, the lowest you're ever going to get is an 8. Uh, so 8 would be below average. Now, because we're heroes, we don't get into those lower numbers, lower than 8, very much. Our characters might have weaknesses, but not severe weaknesses. We're heroes, we're adventurers, uh, so those weaknesses aren't massive weaknesses. So using standard array, we're going to assign some ability scores. We have an 8, a 10, a 12, a 13, a 14, and a 15. Then after we choose our race, we're going to apply some racial bonuses as well. Uh, but to begin with, assigning these, we're going to be looking to put our 8 in whatever ability score we want to be the lowest. With a rogue, I recommend strength. Because as a rogue, we're going to be using different ability scores to attack, for damage, uh, and for most of our skills, strength is a good one to put a lower score in. The second lowest score I'm going to recommend for charisma. Now remember, 10 is average, so that doesn't mean that our character is not charismatic. It just means that they're average in charisma. The next highest I'm going to put in wisdom. Wisdom affects things like the ability to resist certain kinds of spells, and it affects our perception score. And our perception is something we're going to use for a lot. We're going to be using it when we do things like search a room for traps or look for an ambush. The next highest ability score, I'm going to put in intelligence. Now, with an arcane trickster, and that's the way we're going to go, intelligence is going to be the score that our spells are based off of. So there is some reason why we might even want to make intelligence our highest score. Uh, and there's certain kinds of builds where we would do that. But I think for the standard arcane trickster, we want to be good at intelligence, but it doesn't have to be amazing. So our character is, is very smart, uh, but it's not going to be our best ability score. The next highest score, we're going to put into constitution. Now, constitution is what affects our hit points. That's how much damage we can take before we go down. It affects some other things too, like some saving throws, uh, but there is no character generally that it's a good idea to put a low constitution score. Hit points are important for any kind of character, rogues included. Uh, and as I said before, rogues can go down easily if they're hit, so adding a little bit to constitution at least makes that a little bit harder. So we're taking what is a weakness of the rogue and we're shoring it up a little bit. And finally, our best score is going to be in dexterity. And this is pretty much universal for rogues. The weapons we use are going to be using dexterity. Many of the skills we use are going to be using dexterity. This is kind of our specialty. Now, when we're looking at race, there are a number of options. Even restricted to the player's handbook, some of the best options for rogue are there. Now, our character has a 15 dexterity score. What happens in D&D is every time your score goes up to the next even number, your bonus goes up. So from 10 to 12 to 14 to 16 to 18, those are the points where we get additional bonuses. We're at a 15 now. We'd love to get it to a 16 because we're currently at a plus 2 bonus. 16 would give us a plus 3 bonus. And because this is our specialty, we want at least that plus 3 bonus to begin with. That limits our racial options a little bit, but there's actually still lots of options even just in the player's handbook. Halflings get a bonus to dexterity. Elves get a bonus to dexterity. Certain gnomes get bonuses to dexterity. Humans get bonuses to dexterity. Human variants can choose a bonus to dexterity. Half-elves can choose a bonus to dexterity. The race I'm going to recommend for first level arcane tricksters, if we're only using the player's handbook, is the high elf. The High Elf gives us all kinds of things that we want for this style of character. First off, we're going to get a plus two bonus to dexterity. Of course, we want more dexterity, but we're also going to get a plus one bonus to our intelligence. Now, our intelligence is currently sitting at 13, so that bumps it up to 14, which gives it the ne that next bonus. So now our bonus for intelligence is plus two, which is not bad. And then we have the plus three bonus to dexterity, which is good. Another thing that High Elf gets us is it gets us proficiency into what we call the Elven weapons, which includes things like longsword, but more importantly, longbow, which means we can now use a longbow. Now, a longbow isn't a lot better than a short bow, and for something like a rogue, it might not even be any better than a light crossbow, but I like the idea of using a longbow with an elf, and it's at least as good as any other weapon we could choose. Elves also get dark vision, which means they can see in the dark. Now, anything they see in the dark is treated as dim light, so it's not easy to see things that are hidden, but it does allow us to sneak around in dark areas. And finally, elves get keen senses. That means they get the perception skill for free. Now, we've already selected the perception skill. That means we can now choose another skill instead. Finally, 
high elves get a starting cantrip, uh, and that starting cantrip is based on their intelligence score. Now, because we are going to be moving this character in a spellcasting direction, that gets us started even before we select Arcane Trickster at level 3. So as an elf, we're going to choose our cantrip, that's our spell, and our extra language. Now, a cantrip is the least powerful kind of spell, but we can cast it over and over again. The spell I'm going to re recommend taking at first level is Minor Illusion. Now, if you are playing with other source books, you might want to look, if you're playing with Sword Coast Adventures Guide, at Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade. These are good options for an arcane trickster. But if we're playing with Player's Handbook alone, then Minor Illusion, I think, is far and away the best choice at level 1. I do have a video on how to use Minor Illusion, but the very simple fact is you can use it to create a barrier. And a barrier is something you can hide behind. So you make a rock or a bush or a barrel, and then that gives you something to hide behind in combat, or even in somewhere where you just can't find a hiding spot before the enemy arrives. Or even if you're trying to evade an enemy, to create a hiding spot just so that they cannot find you. For a rogue, I think Minor Illusion is an excellent spell to take. And if you want to know more about the Minor Illusion spell, I will link uh, my video on Minor Illusion in the description down below. So because we have the Perception skill through Elf, we are going to get an additional skill, and my suggestion for this one is Investigation. Uh, investigation is based off intelligence, and it can be just finding information at something like, like a library, but some DMs will use it for examining rooms, looking for traps, that kind of thing. It really depends on the DM and the adventure. Uh, so to have that kind of covers our basis in the things we're supposed to do. We also get an additional language. Now what language you take really depends on your campaign. One thing I kind of like to do is if there are other races in the party, I like to choose one of their racial languages, and that gives us a secret language we can communicate in. So let's pretend there's a dwarf in our party, then we'll take dwarvish, and now we can speak to that dwarf in their native language. So let's go to our starting equipment. For a beginning character, I strongly recommend you go with your starting equipment package rather than rolling for gold and then buying equipment. It is going to be so much easier and it's going to give you the basics of what you need to play. Now our equipment choices begin with either a rapier or a short sword. Now a rapier will do more damage than a short sword, but a short sword would allow us to use a weapon in our offhand. Now attacking with a weapon in your offhand is actually a decent strategy at level 1. It uses up your bonus action every round, but we don't have a lot of things to do with our bonus action. That said, after level 1, once cunning action comes into play, we're often only going to be doing a single attack. So we might as well take our better weapon now. And the better weapon, in the long run, is going to be the rapier. We can then choose a short bow and a quiver of 20 arrows, or a short sword. Uh, now we can use a long bow with this character, or a light crossbow. Both of those are a little bit superior to the short bow. But the short bow is still a decent weapon. It does a d6 damage, has a decent range, uh, so it's not a bad weapon for us to start with. We then choose a Burglar's Pack, a Dungeoneer's Pack, or an Explorer's Pack. If you are playing a Rogue, I recommend taking the Burglar's Pack every time. A Burglar's Pack gives you a backpack. Now, pretty much every pack is going to give you a backpack, something to carry your stuff in. A bag of a thousand ball bearings. This doesn't sound like much, but what you do is, number one, you can throw ball bearings on the ground and make difficult terrain. Another thing you can do is you can take a ball bearing and you can roll it down a dungeon hallway and it might set off some traps or it might alert some enemies or it might be a way to determine if something's an illusion. If something's an illusionary wall, the ball bearing will roll right through it. We can also drop it down the well, see how long it takes before we hear the splash. There's all kinds of little things you can do with ball bearings. They tend to be the roguish kind of things, uh, so I think that's a nice addition to this pack. We get 10 feet of string and a bell. These obviously go together. The idea here is so that you can rig a doorway so that if it opens you can hear the bell ringing or uh, something along the base of a hallway so that a tripwire, so if somebody goes over it, you hear the bell ringing. It's mainly used for the creation of an alarm. Then we get a crowbar. Crowbar gives you an advantage on strength checks to open things. So uh, if you just are unable to pick the lock, you can use a crowbar to force something open. Or if something's barred from the other side, you may not have another option. 
the hammer and ten pitons go together. This is a way that you can create things in a wall that you could potentially climb up, or you can hammer a door so that it can't be opened. Uh, so again, dungeon crawling kind of things. The hooded lantern, the tinderbox, and the oil, great. Uh, hooded lantern has a good range of both dim and bright light. Now, with dark vision, we can see in the dark. That doesn't mean the rest of the party can. Hooded lantern is a great way for them to do so. Furthermore, with dark vision, all you can see is treated as if it's in dim light. That means that finding things that are hidden, you're going to have disadvantage. But because we have a hooded lantern, we can create a good area of bright light for us to see through. So don't think that a hooded lantern isn't of any use. Now you can put the hood on the lantern. The point of that is it reduces the amount of light it sheds. So if you are, say, coming close to a corner in a dungeon you're crawling and you don't want somebody around the corner to be able to see you, you could potentially put the hood on the hooded lantern so that it doesn't shed light around that corner, that kind of thing. You get a water skin, that's pretty standard. 50 feet of rope, that's pretty standard. And five days of rations, and rations are pretty standard too. We're also going to get leather armor. Leather armor is not very good, but it's all we're going to start with, so we'll take it. We also get two daggers and thieves tools. Uh, two daggers would mean that if we want to, we could still do two weapon fighting using two daggers. I think generally speaking, we're going to be better off with our rapier. And the thieves tools, of course, does things like open locks and disable traps. We get another crowbar to start, so you might as well give that to another party member. We already have one. Uh, we're going to get a set of dark common clothes, including a hood, which is kind of appropriate for our kind of character, and a pouch with 15 gold pieces. So our first level character is all done, so this is what it looks like in the end. Uh, our beginner arcane trickster has 10 hit points. 10 hit points is going to be pretty average for your group. It's probably not going to be the best, and it probably won't be the worst. We're going to start with a 14 armor class. That's not great. It's not terrible, though. Uh, a lot of enemies will still miss us if they attack us. We're going to get a plus three bonus to any initiative roll. That's a good thing. So that means more often we're going to go first. Our attacks generally are going to have a plus five bonus to hit. That's a good bonus at first level. And our rapier is going to do a d8 plus three damage. On average, that'll be seven and a half points of damage. That's good damage for first level. And then our short bow is going to do a d6 plus three damage or six and a half points of damage, which is still not bad damage for first level. Of course, that doesn't include sneak attack. If we get sneak attack, then we are adding an additional d6. So suddenly that seven and a half from the rapier becomes 11 points of damage. And 11 points of damage is great for first level. And even with the short bow, that's 10 points of damage. Also very strong damage for first level. So that sneak attack is something we want to get. So how do we make sure we get sneak attack? Well, if we can have a chance to hide before combat begins, that's great. That will give us advantage on that first attack because we are attacking from hidden. But by far the easiest way to get sneak attack is make sure to attack enemies that have an ally beside them. If you have an ally beside them, you will get your sneak attack. Now, because we have both the rapier and the short bow, that means we can do either melee or ranged. Often, it's easier to find a hiding spot at range and then pop up. So often, you might find that short bow, even though it's doing a little bit less damage, is the better option. Now, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to switch out that short bow for either a light crossbow or a long bow as soon as we can, because that will do an additional point of damage. That's not a lot of damage. It's not an emergency. The short bow does just fine for now. Uh, so. I wouldn't worry about it too much, but once the opportunity comes up to switch it off for a light crossbow or a longbow, do so. If we look along our skill proficiencies, we're going to see that lots of bonuses there. Some as high as plus seven. That's very, very high for first level. And even all these plus fives are very good. We don't have a great wisdom, but because we took expertise, we get that plus five to begin with. That's very nice to have for perception for first level. So generally, in combat, I recommend Hide if you can before the battle. Once the battle starts and you're revealed, it's too late for that. Don't take your action to hide after that. After that, attack every round. Attack every round with either your rapier or your short bow and get sneak attack whenever you can. If you have an ally beside an enemy, that's the one you should be attacking. If you have two choices and you can attack this enemy or that enemy and that enemy is when you qualify for sneak attack, that's the one you want to attack because that increased damage, that sneak attack, that's what makes you a rogue. That's what makes you special 
and you want to access that as much as you can. Now in some cases there is talk about rogues being scouts so that they move way ahead of the party so that they can stealthily check out for enemies or traps. I'm not a big fan of that strategy, especially if it's any kind of significant distance. Uh, the reason is because if you get in trouble, you could die very fast. Rogues aren't super tough. And at this level, we don't have a lot of methods to get away in a hurry. So what I recommend is if you do want to do scouting, then move ahead of your party maybe 15 or 20 feet. This way you're still in range of the party to close very quickly if they need to. They can use a small light source, like maybe the lantern with the hood on it or a candle. So then that way you're out of the light entirely. You can still take advantage of your dark vision and you're not revealed. So that's what I recommend. Don't go way ahead. If you do, that's what ends up making your character die. So what's our character really good at? Well, good at delivering damage. We're good at acrobatics. We're reasonably good at arcana. We're good at perception, sleight of hand, which is things like picking pockets, and sneaking is kind of our specialty. Very good at that. And our investigation is reasonably good with a plus four. When it comes to hit points, pretty average. When it comes to armor class, probably a little bit below average. So be careful. Don't get within range of the enemy's attacks or make yourself an obvious target to enemies if it can be avoided. So let's take our character to level two. So cunning action is an ability gained at level two. It's a very simple ability but it's really, really useful. Every turn, you can use your bonus action to take the hide, disengage, or dash action. So, as I mentioned last level, uh, you don't have a lot to do with your bonus actions. Uh, so we're probably not using our bonus actions most of the time. Probably nobody in our party is using their bonus actions most of the time. As a second level rogue, we can now use our bonus action pretty much every round, often for something really useful. So dash, disengage, and hide, what are they? Well, dash allows us to move our full movement again. So if we were running normally, we could use our movement to move 30 feet, and then we could use our action to dash another 30 feet. So we would have a total maximum movement of 60 feet. But because we have cunning action, we could then use our bonus action to move yet another 30 feet. We can technically move 90 feet. This makes rogues far faster than other characters, if moving maximum distance is the goal. What the disengage action does is whenever your movement would provoke an attack of opportunity, it doesn't. Uh, so if we get caught in melee and we want to get out, we can use the disengage action as a bonus action, and we still get our action which we can attack with on our rounds. We're not giving up our action in order to disengage from combat. Furthermore, if we're outside of melee, we can go into melee, attack, then use our bonus action to disengage and move out of melee again, as long as it's all within that 30 foot distance. If you do have access to the Sword Coast Adventures Guide, there is a spell called Booming Blade that works very nicely with that strategy. But finally, we can use our bonus action to hide. Remember how I said Minor Illusion was super good for rogues? This is one of those cases. So what we can do is, if we end up in combat, we can use our first action to cast a Minor Illusion to create a rock or a bush or a barrel or a crate, something big enough to hide behind. Then we can use our bonus action to hide behind that illusion. So now we're hidden and our next attack would be with advantage and automatically qualify for sneak attack. Furthermore, next round, after attacking, we can use our bonus action to hide again. So we can use our bonus action every round to hide and then every round we can attack with sneak attack. That is just a fantastic combination available only to rogues with either the minor illusion spell or somewhere else to hide. The other thing that changes at this level is our hit points have increased. So we've gone from 10 to 17 and although that's a lot higher, remember that your other party members all went up too and those that had more hit points than you before have even more hit points than you now. Uh, so again, the 17 is fine. It's not a problem. Uh, also at second level, hopefully if we've had a level of adventuring, we might be able to afford studded leather armor and our longbow now. So let's go ahead and change our equipment. So if we look at our equipment now, we'll see that our longbow is doing a D8 plus 3 instead of the D6 plus 3. That on average is going to be one extra point of damage. Not a huge deal, but one extra point of damage when you're normally doing 10 points of damage is like a 10% increase. So it is significant. You'll also see now with our studded leather armor, our armor class is 15. 
Now that's as good as we're going to get with any mundane equipment. We can increase that with some magic items or there's feet options later on. If we increase our dexterity that will go up. But for now 15 at least boosts us a little bit. And because studded leather isn't very expensive that means we might get that boost before the other players start getting their boosts. Uh, so now that armor class of 15 puts us it's still not one of the better armor classes, but it's okay. But that's all that really changes at second level. It's not a lot of stuff. So let's move our character to third level. So our third level is where we pick our roguish archetype. And the roguish archetype we're going to select is the arcane trickster at this point. So this is the first point where our character stops being just a rogue and becomes an arcane trickster. Arcane trickster is going to give us spells. and It's also going to give us a specialty in a particular spell which we'll talk about in a little bit. So this is a spell chart. As you can see, Rogue Level 3, we're going to know three cantrips, three spells known, and we can cast two first level spells. So what does that mean? Well, cantrips known three. That's in addition to the cantrip we learned at first level by being a high elf. So we're actually going to know four cantrips. We're going to know three cantrips plus minor illusion. Now, spells known in 3 means leveled spells, so these are non-cantrip spells, so levels of level 1 and higher. And you can only know spells of the levels you can cast. So we'll know three first level spells, and we can switch between them however we like. So whenever we cast a spell, we can choose any of those three spells to cast. And finally, we have two first level spell slots. That means we can only cast first level spells, and we can only cast two of them. So we can cast two spells between every long rest. That's basically two spells per day. It's not a lot. Uh, most of what we can cast is cantrips, but twice a day we can cast a more powerful spell. Now when it comes to those three cantrips, one of those cantrips has to be Mage Hand. We learn Mage Hand and two other cantrips of our choice. Now D&D Beyond doesn't select Mage Hand for us, so we're going to select it right now. So this is what Mage Hand does. It's a 30 foot range, 1 minute spell, doesn't use concentration. A spectral floating hand appears at a point you choose within range. The hand lasts for the duration or until you dismiss it as an action. The hand vanishes if it's ever more than 30 feet away from you or if you cast a spell again. You can use your action to control the hand. You can use the hand to manipulate an object, open an unlocked door or container, stow or retrieve an item from an open container, or pour the contents out of a vial. You can move the hand up to 30 feet each time you use it. The hand can't attack, activate magic items, or carry more than 10 pounds. So it's basically like a small telekinesis spell. The next spell I'm going to recommend is Prestidigitation. Uh, Prestidigitation, I think, if it's the first time you're playing a spellcaster, it's almost a must-have. It's going to give you all the flavor of playing a spellcaster that you wanted to have in actual role-playing experience. Let's take a look at what it can do. So the first thing to remember is, as a cantrip, you can cast this all you want. It has a range of up to 10 feet and can last for up to an hour. You can create one of the following magical effects within range. You can create an instantaneous, harmless sensory effect, such as a shower of sparks, a puff of wind, faint musical notes, or an odd odor. You can instantaneously light or snuff out a candle, a torch, or a small campfire. You can instantaneously clean or soil an object no larger than one cubic foot. You can chill, warm, or flavor up to one cubic foot of non-living material for one hour. You can make color, a small mark, or symbol appear on an object or surface for an hour. You can create a non-magical trinket or an illusionary image that can fit in your hand and last until the end of your turn. So, just if we're thinking about role-playing, this just does an enormous number of little things. If you want your character to feel magical, this is the way to do it. You walk into the inn, light the lantern. They bring you the food, it's gotten cold, you warm it up. Mmm, doesn't taste good, oh, now it does. Oh, I spilled some on my clothes, now they're clean. It just gives you that sense of that magic is at your beck and call to make your life easy. Also, of course, there's little parlor tricks, like having the glowing butterfly appear in the palm of your hand and fly away. All those little things that you kind of see wizards and spellcasters do in things like movies and books, we can kind of do all of these things with prestidigitation. It's not something we're going to use in combat, but it is something we're going to use in role playing all the time. It's going to make you feel like your character has now learned magic. We're going to get one more cantrip 
Now again, if we're just using Player's Handbook, there's a limited number of good options here. Uh, I like Light, I like Mending, I like Message. Message is the spell I'm going to recommend, because I do think thematically it is a good choice for a rogue. With the spell Message, you point your finger towards a creature within range and whisper a message. The target, and only the target, hears the message and can reply in a whisper that only you can hear. So this is almost like telepathy. You can do this through solid objects, if you're familiar with the target and know they're beyond the barrier. It doesn't have to follow a straight line, and can travel around corners or through openings. So first off, this gives you a way you can make secret messages with people you want to that no one else can hear, even if they're in the room. It could also allow you to do things like communicate back to your party if they're through a wall or a door. So I do think it's appropriate for a rogue, and it's a decent spell. So now we're going to choose our spells. Now, we only can choose three spells, but we can only cast two spells. That means we're not going to cast all these spells every day. These are the spells we can choose from casting every day, and there are restrictions for an arcane trickster. We choose three first level wizard spells of our choice, two of which we must choose from either the enchantment or illusion spells on the wizard list. Uh, so we get one spell, we can choose any first level spell on the wizard list, uh, and the other two are limited to either enchantment or illusion spells. So here's the list of enchantment and illusion spells on the wizard list that are first level. Charm Person, Color Spray, Disguise Self, Hideous Laughter, Illusory Script, Silent Image, and Sleep. Tasha's Hideous Laughter is the same as Hideous Laughter. They just Either it has Tasha's or it doesn't, uh, but it's the same spell. Think about Sleep. Sleep is an amazing spell at first level. You may have already seen Sleep in action and wish you had it. Now you could get it, but don't take it because you're at third level and, we, and Sleep is that spell that is so great at first level pretty good at second level, but by third level it's not so good anymore. And by fourth, fifth level, it's not going to be useful at all. The spells I'm going to recommend we take are Color Spray and Disguise Self. The first one I'm going to talk about is Disguise Self, and it's an illusion spell, and I think it's really appropriate for a rogue-style character. It's a one-hour duration, it doesn't use a concentration, so if you're worrying about concentration mechanic, Disguise Self isn't going to be involved in that. And what it does is with one action, it allows us to change our appearance, as if we were disguising ourselves. But of course, it's much, much faster than actual disguising ourselves, and it doesn't require a disguise kit. So you're being chased by the town guards. You round a corner, you cast Disguise Self. They come around the corner, and all they see is a homeless person sitting on the side of a building. And they go, uh, did you see that elf running by? And then you go, I saw him that way, and they go running off. Uh, that's the kind of thing that Disguise Self is useful for. Or maybe you're sneaking around in a cavern you know is inhabited by a bunch of gnolls. So you can Disguise Self, make yourself appear like a gnoll. So then if you do get discovered, they may not realize right away that you're an infiltrator. So a kind of spell that's appropriate for your kind of character, it's not going to and it's not going to be a big deal that your intelligence isn't quite as high as, say, a wizard of your level. The second spell I recommend is Color Spray. Now, Color Spray uses a cone, a 15-foot cone, uh, and we're going to talk about that more in a moment. But what Color Spray does is you cast it, takes one action, does not use your concentration. You are going to roll 60 10. That's significantly more dice and bigger dice than you're going to get with Sleep, so you can affect a lot more hit dice. But the total is how many hit points of creatures the spell can affect. It's normally going to affect either one medium strength creature or a few very weak creatures. Starting with the creature with the lowest hit points, each creature affected by the spell is blinded until the end of your next turn. Uh, and blinded is lovely because it's going to give them disadvantage on all their attack rolls, it's going to give you and your allies advantage on all your attack rolls, and of course that is going to grant you advantage for sneak attack as well. And there's no saving throw for a color spray, so as long as you roll enough to meet their hit points, they will be affected by it. Duration isn't very long, so act fast. So what's a cone? How do we use it in play? So there are two ways we can cast a cone. We can cast it diagonally, or we can cast it adjacent. Uh, so here's our rogue right here. And they're going to cast color spray diagonally. Now a 15 foot cone is going to cover six squares. So, as we can see, we've got our color spray right here, and it has covered six squares of space. So, any creatures within those six squares, 
would be affected. And we can do this from any diagonal. We can also fire the cone straight ahead. If we do so, then it looks like this. So what happens is we choose one square right by our character, and we choose two squares that are a square away from our character, and then three squares at the maximum range. Now the one thing you can choose is this guy right here, you can put on either side. You choose. So if you have an enemy in this square, then you would probably choose to have it there, so it affects them. On the other hand, if you have an ally in that square and you're worried it might affect them, you can move it over here. And again, this could be up, down, or up to either side. The final spell I'm going to recommend is Find Familiar. Now, Find Familiar is not an illusion or enchantment spell, so that's the one spell we can take that's not from those schools. And the Find Familiar spell is going to give you a spirit. The spirit's going to take a small animal form that serves you. And you can see through its eyes and hear through its ears. It can do lots of other things, too. So many things I'm not going to come close to explaining them all in this video. But what I am going to do is I'm going to link down below. I did a whole video on Find Familiar that can walk you through everything that a familiar can do for you. I think you'll be blown away by it. Now, if that's a little overwhelming and you don't want to take on a Find Familiar spell, then go ahead and take the Shield spell. The Shield spell would be the next one I recommend. It would give you a plus 5 armor class at need. Very easy to use. Uh, but the thing about Find Familiar is we can cast it ahead of time. So even though we can only cast two spells per day, we're going to have that familiar without having to cast any more spells to keep it up. Finally, that familiar is an ally. So remember, if that ally is within five feet of an enemy, we get sneak attack. Furthermore, that ally can do a help action. That could give us advantage, which also gives us sneak attack. So there's lots of ways we can use our familiar to grant us that sneak attack. And speaking of sneak attack, third level is the level where it jumps up to 2d6. So our sneak attack damage essentially just doubled. That means it's more important than ever to qualify for sneak attack whenever you can. This is one of my favorite things about the Arcane Trickster. At third level, when we select Arcane Trickster, Mage Hand Legerdemain. Starting at third level, when we cast Mage Hand, we can make the hand invisible and we can perform additional tasks with it. We can stow an object the hand is holding in a container worn or carried by another creature. We can retrieve an object in a container worn or carried by another creature. We can use thieves tools to pick locks and disarm traps at range. You can perform one of these tasks without being noticed by a creature if you succeed on a dexterity sleight of hand check contested by the creature's wisdom perception check. In addition, you can use the bonus action granted by your cunning action to control the hand. So, a bunch of stuff going on here. The big one for me is we can now pick locks and open doors and all those things at range. So if there is a trap and it explodes, we're often going to be out of that range. It gives us a safety barrier. Things like poison needles and that kind of thing. The other thing we can do is we can use our hand to pick pockets. And it's invisible, so it can't even be seen. Wouldn't even necessarily be able to be pinned on us even if they notice. We can do little things like in combat. You see that spellcaster over there who constantly is going to that component pouch? You can use your mage hand to take that component pouch away. And even if he notices, you still got that mage's component pouch. And that is going to limit his spellcasting significantly. And that's only your bonus action. So you can still attack him on your round. So although our combat stats haven't really changed, what has changed then is our sneak attack damage. So every time we hit, we're going to do an additional three and a half points of damage on average. Uh, so suddenly that rapier that was doing 11 points of damage at level one is now doing 14 and a half points of damage. Same thing for the longbow. That's decent damage for level three. There are ways to do more damage at level three with an attack. But remember, we're also doing this every round. When you see something like a paladin smite and they do more damage than you, just remember they have limited numbers of those smites. We don't have limited numbers of sneak attack. We're going to keep delivering that decent damage all the time. So let's go to level 4. If you are a beginning character, you're going to hear all about feats. Uh, but what I would recommend is if you're new to the game, always use an ability score increase when it comes up. And you're going to get one at level 4 and then at levels beyond that, depending on what class you are, which levels they pop up. Uh, and you can use them either for a feat 
or to increase ability scores by two points. That can be either two points for one ability score or one point for two different ability scores. Generally, with a new player, I say increase your primary ability score. Uh, in our case, it's dexterity. If we think that it's not only increasing our saving throws, it's also increasing our initiative. Several skills we use a lot are armor class, our attack rolls, our damage. It just comes up over and over. No matter what class you're playing, adding plus two to your primary ability score is never a bad choice. However, if I'm going to suggest the best option for you at this level, because we have a 17 dexterity score right now, which is an odd number, if we can find a feat that increases our dexterity by one and gives us anything else at all, it's better than increasing our dexterity by two. Uh, and in the player's handbook, there's really one option there, and that would be the athlete feat. So if we choose the athlete feat, we can now choose to increase our dexterity score by one point. That gives us the 18 dexterity, which gives us the exact same bonus we would have had if we put plus two into dexterity. And because all our other ability scores are also even, adding plus one to one of them doesn't do anything for us. Now what the athlete feat does for us in addition isn't that big a deal, but it's something rather than nothing. So when we're prone, standing up only uses five feet of movement. Normally, that would use half our movement. Now we're not prone all that much. Maybe if you're hidden, you might be. Climbing doesn't cost you extra movement. So as a rogue, we might be climbing a fair bit, up or down ropes. Now we can do it with our full movement speed. And we can make a running long jump or a running high jump after moving only five feet on foot rather than 10 feet. So it just gives you a little bit of extra maneuverability. These are all small bonuses, but because that plus one dexterity is all we needed, they're just extra bonuses. So I kind of recommend taking them regardless. At fourth level, we are going to learn one more spell that must be from the illusion or enchantment school. And we are going to have one more first level spell we can cast each day. So the first level spell I will pick is Tasha's Hideous Laughter. Now Tasha's Hideous Laughter affects one target and they do get a saving throw. And our intelligence is good, but it's not great. And it's certainly not where we would expect a primary spellcaster to be. So our saving throw is going to be a little bit lower. Uh, our enemy would require a 12 on a wisdom saving throw. And if it was cast by, say, a wizard or a bard in our party, we would probably expect a saving throw of 14. Uh, so they have a better chance to save, but it's not a hugely better chance to save. There's still a good chance of failure. It can be used up to 30 feet away, and if they fail their saving throw, they fall prone and are incapacitated. This, of course, sets you up for sneak attack. It also just gets them out of the fight. And this uses our concentration, but we're not using our concentration on anything. So this is no problem, and we can concentrate for up to a minute and they get one saving throw at the end of each of their turns. And if they fail, it lasts for another round. So this could last for several rounds. This is kind of an all or nothing scenario. And in, but also unlike color spray, it can affect something with a lot of hit points. So we can take down creatures that are a lot tougher. So if I'm in a combat where there's a lot of creatures that maybe aren't very powerful, and one that is very powerful, and I want to do something that affects the one that's very powerful, Tasha's Hideous Laughter is what I want to try. Now, if they save, it's not going to work. But if they don't save, it's quite debilitating. Now, what this all looks like on our character, we now have 31 hit points. It's basically going to be going up 7 every level. Armor class is currently 16, so it went up because our dexterity went up. 16, still not great, but we're getting to the level where we might start to find things like magic armor, and that could increase that more. Initiative of plus 4 is pretty good. Now we have a plus six bonus for all our attacks, so that's all improved. And we're going to be adding an extra point of damage to all our attacks as well uh, because of our dexterity increase. We have a lot of skills that are starting to look better too because a lot of these skills are dexterity skills and they all got a boost from us increasing our dexterity. So our acrobatics went up, our sleight of hand went up, our stealth all, and our stealth went up too. So that is my guide for beginners. For making an arcane trickster. Uh, so I tried to keep it simple here. It's still a reasonably complicated process for beginners. I know those who have a lot of experience in games, this seems like simple stuff, but we've been doing it for decades. For people who are doing it new for the first time, 
It's a little bit tough, but if you make the character the way that I showed you, you're going to find that it is effective and not hard to play. Just follow the strategies I've given, and I think you're going to find it a lot of fun. And because you're kind of using a little bit of spells, next time, if you want to try something a little more complicated, you're going to have a basis on how to use those things. So I hope you found it useful. Until next time, I'm going to sit back and relax, and I'm going to have some fun, because D&D is for everyone. Thanks, guys. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.